Chapter 4 Third Month of Inundation 15th Day Imhotep listened to Sobek's explanation of the sale of the timber in ominous silence. His face had grown very red and a small pulse was beating in his temple. Sobek's air of easy nonchalance wore a little thin. He had intended to carry things off with a high hand, but in the face of his father's gathering frowns, he found himself stammering and hesitating. Imhotep finally cut him short impatiently. Yes, 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 you thought that you knew more than I did, you departed from my instructions, it is always the essay. Me, unless I am here to see to everything, he sighed. What would become of you boys without me I cannot imagine. Sobek went on doggedly. There was a chance of making a much bigger profit, I took the risk. One cannot always be pettifogging and cautious. There is nothing cautious about you, Sobek. You are rash and much too bold and your judgment is always wrong. Do I ever have a chance to exercise my judgment? Imhotep said drilly. You have done so this time and against my express orders. Orders? Have I always got to take orders? I am a grown man. Losing control of his temper, Imhotep shouted. Who feeds you, who clothes you? Who thinks of the future? Who has your welfare, the welfare of all of you, constantly in mind? When the river was low and we were threatened with famine, did I not arrange for food to be sent south to you? You are lucky to have such a father who thinks of everything. And what do I ask in return? Only that you should work hard, do your best, and obey the instructions I send you. Yes, shouted Sobek. We are to work for you like slaves so that you can buy gold and jewels for your concubine. Imhotep advanced towards him, bristling with rage. Insolent boy to speak like that to your father. Be careful or I will say that this is no longer your home and you can go elsewhere. And if you are not careful I will go. I have ideas, I tell you, good ideas that would bring in wealth if I was not tied down by pettifogging caution and never allowed to act as I choose. Have you finished? Imhotep's tone was ominous. Sobek, a trifle deflated, muttered angrily. Yes, yes, I have no more to say now. Then go and see after the cattle. This is no time for idling. Sobek turned and strode angrily away. Nilfrit was standing not far away and as he passed her she looked sideways at him and laughed. At her laugh the blood came up in Sobek's face he made an angry half-step towards her. She stood quite still, looking at him out of contemptuous half-closed eyes. Sobek muttered something and resumed his former direction. Nilfrit laughed again, then walked slowly on to where Imhotep was now turning his attention to Yamos. What possessed you to let Sobek act in that foolish fashion, he demanded irritably. You should have prevented it. Don't you know by now that he has no judgment in buying and selling? He thinks everything will turn out as he wants it to turn out. Yamos said apologetically. You do not realize my difficulties, father. You told me to entrust Sobek with the sale of the timber. It was necessary therefore that it should be left to him to use his judgment. Judgment? Judgment? He has no judgment. He is to do what I instruct him to do and it is for you to see that he does exactly that. Yamos flushed. I? What authority have I? What authority? The authority I give you. But I have no real status. If I were legally associated with you. He broke off as Nofrit came up. She was yawning and twisting a scarlet poppy in her hands. Won't you come to the little pavilion by the lake, Imhotep? It is cool there and there is fruit waiting for you and Kata beer. Surely you have finished giving your orders by now. In a minute, Nofrit, in a minute. Nofrit said in a soft, deep voice. Come now. I want you to come now. Imhotep looked pleased and a little sheepish. Yamos said quickly before his father could speak. Let us just speak of this first. It is important. I want to ask you. Nofrit spoke directly to Imhotep, turning her shoulder on Yamos. Can you not do what you want in your own house? Imhotep said sharply to Yamos. Another time, my son. Another time. He went with Nofrit and Yamos stood on the porch looking after them. 
Satipi came out from the house and joined him. Well, she demanded eagerly, have you spoken to him? What did he say? Yamo sighed. Do not be so impatient, Satipi. The time was not propitious. Satipi gave an angry exclamation. Oh yes, that is what you would say. That is what you will always say. The truth is you are afraid of your father, you are as timid as a sheep, you bleed at him, you will not stand up to him like a man. Do you not recall the things you promised me? I tell you I am the better man of us too. You promise, you say, I will ask my father at once, the very first day. And what happens? Satipi paused for breath, not because she had finished but Yamos cut in mildly. You are wrong, Satipi. I began to speak but we were interrupted. Interrupted? By whom? By Nofrit. Nofrit. That woman. Your father should not let his concubine interrupt when he is speaking of business to his eldest son. Women should not concern themselves with business. Possibly Yamos wished that Satipi herself would live up to the maxim she was enunciating so glibly, but he was given no opportunity to speak. His wife swept on. Your father should have made that clear to her at once. My father, said Yamos drilly, showed no signs of displeasure. It is disgraceful, Satipi declared. Your father is completely bewitched by her. He lets her say and do as she pleases. Yamos said thoughtfully. She is very beautiful. Satipi snorted. Oh, she has looks of a kind. But no manners. No upbringing. She does not care how rude she is to all of us. Perhaps you are rude to her. I am the soul of politeness. Kate and I treat her with every courtesy. Oh, she shall have nothing of which to go complaining to your father. We can wait our time, Kate and I. Yamos looked up sharply. How do you mean wait your time? Satipi laughed meaningfully as she moved away. My meaning is woman's meaning you would not understand. We have our ways and our weapons. Nofrit would do well to moderate her insolence. What does a woman's life come to in the end, after all? It is spent in the back of the house amongst the other women. There was a peculiar significance in Satipi's tone. She added. Your father will not always be here, he will go away again to his estates in the north. And then we shall see. Satipi. Satipi laughed a hard-sounding, high laugh, and went back into the house. 2. By the lake the children were running about and playing. Yamos two boys were fine, handsome little fellows, looking more like Satipi than like their father. Then there were Sobix three, the youngest a mere toddling baby. And there was Teddy, a grave, handsome child of four years old. They laughed and shouted, threw balls, occasionally a dispute broke out and a childish wail of anger rose high and shrill. Sitting sipping his beer, with Nofrit beside him, Imhotep murmured, how fond children are of playing by water. It was always so, I remember. But, by Hather, what a noise they make. Nofrit said quickly. Yes, and it could be so peaceful. Why do you not tell them to go away whilst you are here? After all when the master of the house wants relaxation a proper respect should be shown. Don't you agree? I, well, Imhotep hesitated. The idea was new to him, but pleasing. I do not really mind them, he finished, doubtfully. He added rather weakly. They are accustomed to play here always as they please. When you are away, yes, said Nofrit quickly. But I think, Imhotep, considering all that you do for your family, they should show more sense of your dignity of your importance. You are too gentle, too easygoing. Imhotep sighed placidly. It has always been my failing. I never insist on the outward forms. And therefore these women, your son's wives, take advantage of your kindness. It should be understood that when you come here for repose, there must be silence and tranquility. See? I will go and tell Kate to take her children away and the others too. Then you shall have peace and contentment here. You are a thoughtful girl, Nofrit, yes, a good girl. You are always thinking of my comfort. Nofrit murmured, your pleasure is mine. 
She got up and went to where Kate was kneeling by the water playing with a little model barge which her second child, a rather spolt looking boy, was trying to float. No Fritz said curtly. Will you take the children away, Kate? Kate stared up at her uncomprehendingly. Away? What do you mean? This is where they always play. Not today. Imhotep wants peace. These children of yours are noisy. Color flamed into Kate's heavy face. You should mend your ways of speech, Nofrit. Imhotep likes to see his son's children playing here. He has said so. Not today, said Nofrit. He has sent me to tell you to take the whole noisy brood into the house, so that he can sit in peace with me. With you, Kate stopped abruptly in what she had been about to say. Then she got up and walked to where Imhotep was half sitting, half lying. Nofrit followed her. Kate spoke without circumlocution. Your concubine says I am to take the children away from here. Why? What are they doing that is wrong? For what reason should they be banished? I should have thought the wish of the master of the house was enough, said Nofrit softly. Exactly, exactly, said Imhotep pettishly. Why should I have to give reasons, whose house is this? I suppose it is she who wants them away. Kate turned and looked Nofrit up and down. Nofrit thinks of my comfort of my enjoyment, said Imhotep. No one else in this house ever considers it except perhaps poor Hennet. So the children are not to play here anymore? Not when I have come here to rest. Kate's anger flamed forth suddenly. Why do you let this woman turn you against your own blood? Why should she come and interfere with the ways of the house? With what has always been done? Imhotep suddenly began to shout. He felt a need to vindicate himself. It is I who say what is to be done here, not you. You are all in league to do as you choose to arrange everything to suit yourselves. And when I, the master of the house, come home, no proper attention is paid to my wishes. But I am master here, let me tell you. I am constantly planning and working for your welfare but am I given gratitude, are my wishes respected? No. First, Sobek is insolent and disrespectful, and now you, Kate, try to browbeat me. What am I supporting you all for? Take care or I shall cease to support you. Sobek talks of going then let him go and take you and your children with him. For a moment Kate stood perfectly still. There was no expression at all on her heavy, rather vacant face. Then she said in a voice from which all emotion had been eliminated. I will take the children into the house. She moved a step or two, pausing by Nofrit. In a low voice Kate said. This is your doing, Nofrit. I shall not forget. No, I shall not forget. Chapter 5 Fourth month of inundation fifth day. Imhotep breathed a sigh of satisfaction as he finished his ceremonial duties as mortuary priest. The ritual had been observed with meticulous detail for Imhotep was in every respect a most conscientious man. He had poured the libations, burnt incense, and offered the customary offerings of food and drink. Now, in the cool shade of the adjacent rock chamber where Hori was waiting for him, Imhotep became once more the landowner and the man of affairs. Together the two men discussed business matters, prevailing prices, and the profits resulting from crops, cattle, and timber. After half an hour or so, Imhotep nodded his head with satisfaction. You have an excellent head for business, Hori, he said. The other smiled. I should have, Imhotep. I have been your man of affairs for many years now. And a most faithful one. Now, I have a matter to discuss with you. It concerns IP. He complains that his position is subordinate. He is still very young. But he shows great ability. He feels that his brothers are not always fair to him. Sobek, it seems, is rough and overbearing and Yamos' continual caution and timidity irk him. IP is high-spirited. He does not like taking orders. Moreover he says that it is only I, his father, who have the right to command. That is true, said Hori. And it has struck me, Imhotep, that that is a weakness here on the estate. May I speak freely? Certainly, my good Hori. 
Your words are always thoughtful and well considered. Then I say this. When you are away, Imhotep, there should be someone here who has real authority. I trust my affairs to you and to Yamos. I know that we act for you in your absence, but that is not enough. Why not appoint one of your sons as a partner associate him with you by a legal deed of settlement? Imhotep paced up and down frowning. Which of my sons do you suggest? Sobek has an authoritative manner but he is insubordinate I could not trust him. His disposition is not good. I was thinking of Yamos. He is your eldest son. He has a gentle and affectionate disposition. He is devoted to you. Yes, he has a good disposition but he is too timid, too yielding. He gives in to everybody. Now if I be were only a little older. Hori said quickly. It is dangerous to give power to too young a man. True, true, well, Hori, I will think of what you have said. Yamos is certainly a good son, an obedient son. Hori said gently but urgently. You would, I think, be wise. Imhotep looked at him curiously. What is in your mind, Hori? Hori said slowly. I said just now that it is dangerous to give a man power when he is too young but it is also dangerous to give it to him too late. You mean that he has become too used to obeying orders and not to giving them? Well, perhaps there is something in that. Imhotep sighed. It is a difficult task to rule a family. The women in particular are hard to manage. Satipi has an ungovernable temper, Kate is often sulky. But I have made it clear to them that Nofrit is to be treated in a proper fashion. I think I may say that. He broke off. A slave was coming panting up the narrow pathway. What is this? Master a barge is here. A scribe called Kamini has come with a message from Memphis. Imhotep got up fussily. More trouble, he exclaimed. As sure as R.A. sails the heavens this will be more trouble. Unless I am on hand to attend to things everything goes wrong. He went stamping down the path and Hori sat quite still looking after him. There was a troubled expression on his face. 2. Renazend had been wandering aimlessly along the bank of the Nile when she heard shouts and commotion and saw people running towards the landing stage. She ran and joined them. In the boat that was pulling to shore stood a young man, and just for a moment, as she saw him outlined against the bright light, her heart missed a beat. A mad, fantastic thought leapt into her mind. It is Kai, she thought. Kai returned from the underworld. Then she mocked herself for the superstitious fancy. Because in her own remembrance, she always thought of Kai as sailing on the Nile, and this was indeed a young man of about Kai's build she had imagined a fantasy. This man was younger than Kai, with an easy, supple grace, and had a laughing, gay face. He had come, he told them, from Imhotep's estates in the north. He was a scribe and his name was Kamini. A slave was dispatched for her father and Kamini was taken to the house where food and drink were put before him. Presently her father arrived and there was much consultation and talking. The gist of it all filtered through into the women's quarters with Hennet, as usual, as the purveyor of the news. Renazend sometimes wondered how it was that Hennet always contrived to know all about everything. Kamini, it seemed, was a young scribe in Imhotep's employ, the son of one of Imhotep's cousins. Kamini had discovered certain fraudulent dispositions, a falsifying of the accounts, and since the matter had many ramifications and involved the stewards of the property, he had thought it best to come south in person and report. Renazend was not much interested. It was clever, she thought, of Kamini to have discovered all this. Her father would be pleased with him. The immediate outcome of the matter was that Imhotep made hurried preparations for departure. He had not meant to leave for another two months, but now the sooner he was on the spot the better. The whole household was summoned and innumerable exordiums and recommendations were made. This was to be done and that. Yamos was on no account to do such and such a thing. Sobek was to exercise the utmost discretion over something else. It was all, Renazend thought, very familiar. Yamos was attentive, Sobek was sulky. Hori, as usual, was calm and efficient. 
IP's demands and importunities were put aside with more sharpness than usual. You are too young to have a separate allowance. Obey Yamos. He knows my wishes and commands. Imhotep placed a hand on his eldest son's sh. Ulder. I trust you, Yamos. When I return we will speak once more of a partnership. Yamos flushed quickly with pleasure. He drew himself a little more erect. Imhotep went on. See only that all goes well in my absence. See to it that my concubine is well treated and with due honor and respect. She is in your charge. It is for you to control the conduct of the women of the household. See that Satipi curbs her tongue. See also that Sobek duly instructs Kate. Renazend, also, must act towards Nofrit with courtesy. Then I will have no unkindness shown toward our good Hennet. The women, I know, find her tiresome sometimes. She has been here long and thinks herself privileged to say many things that are sometimes unwelcome. She has, I know, neither beauty nor wit but she is faithful, remember, and has always been devoted to my interests. I will not have her despised and abused. Everything shall be done as you say, said Yamos. But Hennet sometimes makes trouble with her tongue. Pa! Nonsense! All women do. Not Hennet more than another. Now as to Kamini, he shall remain here. We can do with another scribe and he can assist Hori. As for that land that we have rented to the woman ye. Imhotep went off into meticulous details. When at last all was ready for the departure Imhotep felt a sudden qualm. He took Nofrit aside and said doubtfully. Nofrit, are you content to remain here? Would it be, perhaps, best if, after all, you came with me? Nofrit shook her head and smiled. You will not be long absent, she said. Three months, perhaps four. Who knows? You see it will not be long. I shall be content here. Imhotep said fussily. I have enjoined upon Yamos upon all my sons that you are to have every consideration. On their heads be it if you have anything of which to complain. They will do as you say, I am sure, Imhotep. Nofrit paused. Then she said, who is there here whom I can trust absolutely? Someone who is truly devoted to your interests. I do not mean one of the family. Hori, my good Hori. He is in every way my right hand and a man of good sense and discrimination. Nofrit said slowly. He and Yamos are like brothers. Perhaps. There is Kamini. He, too, is a scribe. I will enjoin on him to place himself at your service. If you have anything of which to complain, he will write down your words with his pen and dispatch the complaint to me. Nofrit nodded appreciatively. That is a good thought. Kamini comes from the north. He knows my father. He will not be influenced by family considerations. And Hennet, exclaimed Imhotep. There is Hennet. Yes, said Nofrit, reflectively. There is Hennet. Suppose that you were to speak to her now, in front of me. An excellent plan. Hennet was sent for and came with her usual cringing eagerness. She was full of lamentations over Imhotep's departure. Imhotep cut her short with abruptness. Yes, yes, my good Hennet but these things must be. I am a man who can seldom count on any stretch of peace or rest. I must toil ceaselessly for my family little though they sometimes appreciate it. Now I wish to speak to you very seriously. You love me faithfully and devotedly, I know I can leave you in a position of trust. Guard Nofrit here she is very dear to me. Whoever is dear to you, master, is dear to me, Hennet declared with fervor. Very good. Then you will devote yourself to Nofrit's interests? Hennet turned towards Nofrit who was watching her under lowered lids. You are too beautiful, Nofrit, she said. That is the trouble. That is why the others are jealous but I will look after you I will warn you of all they say and do. You can count on me. There was a pause whilst the eyes of the two women met. You can count on me, Hennet repeated. A slow smile came to Nofrit's lips a rather curious smile. Yes, she said. I understand you, Hennet. 
I think I can count on you. Imhotep cleared his throat noisily. Then I think all is arranged, yes everything is satisfactory. Organization that has always been my strong point. There was a dry cackle of laughter and Imhotep turned sharply to see his mother standing in the entrance of the room. She was supporting her weight on a stick and looked more dried up and malevolent than ever. What a wonderful son I have, she observed. I must not delay there are some instructions to Hori muttering importantly, Imhotep hurried from the room. He managed to avoid meeting his mother's eye. ESA gave an imperious nod of the head to Hennet and Hennet glided obediently out of the room. Nofrit had risen. She and ESA stood looking at each other. ESA said, so my son is leaving you behind? You had better go with him, Nofrit. He wishes me to stay here. Nofrit's voice was soft and submissive. ESA gave a shrill chuckle. Little good that would be if you wanted to go. And why do you not want to go? I do not understand you. What is there for you here? You are a girl who has lived in cities who has perhaps traveled. Why do you choose the monotony of day after day here amongst those who I am frank do not like you who in fact dislike you? So you dislike me? ESA shook her head. No, I do not dislike you. I am old and though I can see but dimly I can still see beauty and enjoy it. You are beautiful, Nofrit, and the sight of you pleases my old eyes. Because of your beauty I wish you well. I am warning you. Go north with my son. Again Nofrit repeated, he wishes me to stay here. The submissive tone was now definitely impregnated with mockery. ESA said sharply. You have a purpose in remaining here. What is it, I wonder? Very well, on your own head be it. But be careful. Act discreetly. And trust no one. She wheeled abruptly and went out. Nofrit stood quite still. Very slowly her lips curved upwards in a wide, cat-like smile. Part 2. Winter. Chapter 6. First month of winter fourth day. Renazend had got into the habit of going up to the tomb almost every day. Sometimes Yamos and Hori would be there together, sometimes Hori alone, sometimes there would be no one but always Renazend was aware of a curious relief and peace a feeling almost of escape. She liked it best when Hori was there alone. There was something in his gravity, his incurious acceptance of her coming, that gave her a strange feeling of contentment. She would sit in the shade of the rock chamber entrance with one knee raised and her hands clasped round it, and stare out over the green belt of cultivation to where the Nile showed a pale gleaming blue and beyond it to a distance of pale soft fawns and creams and pinks, all melting hazily into each other. She had come the first time, months ago now, on a sudden wish to escape from a world of intense femininity. She wanted stillness and companionship and she had found them here. The wish to escape was still with her, but it was no longer a mere revulsion from the stress and fret of domesticity. It was something more definite, more alarming. She said to Hori one day, I am afraid. Why are you afraid, Renazend? He studied her gravely. Renazend took a minute or two to think. Then she said slowly. Do you remember saying to me once that there were two evils, one that came from without and one from within? Yes, I remember. You were speaking, so you said afterwards, about diseases that attack fruit and crops, but I have been thinking it is the same with people. Hori nodded slowly. So you have found that out, yes, you are right, Renazend. Renazend said abruptly. It is happening now, down there at the house. Evil has come from outside. And I know who has brought it. It is Nofrit. Hori said slowly. You think so? Renazend nodded vigorously. Yes, yes, I know what I am talking about. Listen, Hori, when I came up to you here and said that everything was the same even to Satipi and Kate quarreling that was true. 
But those corals, Hori, were not real corals. I mean Satipi and Kate enjoyed them they made the time pass neither of the women felt any real anger against each other. But now it is different. Now they do not just say things that are rude and unpleasant they say things that they mean shall hurt and when they have seen that a thing hurts then they are glad. It is horrid, hori, horrid. Yesterday Satipi was so angry that she ran a long gold pin into Kate's arm and a day or two ago Kate dropped a heavy copper pan full of boiling fat over Satipi's foot. And it is the same everywhere Satipi rails at Yamos far into the night we can all hear her. Yamos looks sick and tired and hunted. And Sobek goes off to the village and stays there with women and comes back drunk and shouts and boasts and says how clever he is. Some of these things are true, I know, said Hori, slowly. But why should you blame Nofrit? Because it is her doing. It is always the things she says, little things, clever things, that start it all. She is like the goad with which you prick oxen. She is clever, too, in knowing just what to say. Sometimes I think it is Hennet who tells her. Yes, said Hori thoughtfully. That might well be. Renazen shivered. I don't like Hennet. I hate the way she creeps about. She is so devoted to us all, and yet none of us want her devotion. How could my mother have brought her here and been so fond of her? We have only Hennet's word for that, said Hori drilly. Why should Hennet be so fond of Nofrit and follow her round and whisper and fawn upon her? Oh, Hori, I tell you I am afraid. I hate Nofrit. I wish she would go away. She is beautiful and cruel and bad. What a child you are, Renazend. Then Hori added quietly. Nofrit is coming up here now. Renazend turned her head. Together they watched Nofrit come slowly up the S. Teep path that led up the cliff face. She was smiling to herself and humming a little tune under her breath. When she reached the place where they were, she looked round her and smiled. It was a smile of amused curiosity. So this is where you slip away to every day, Renazend. Renazend did not answer. She had the angry, defeated feeling of a child whose refuge had been discovered. Nofrit looked about her again. And this is the famous tomb. As you say, Nofrit, said Hori. She looked at him, her cat-like mouth curving into a smile. I've no doubt you find it profitable, Hori. You are a good man of business, so I hear. There was a tinge of malice in her voice, but Hori remained unmoved, smiling his quiet, grave smile. It is profitable to all of us, death is always profitable. Nofrit gave a quick shiver as she looked round her, her eyes sweeping over the offering tables, the entrance to the shrine and the false door. She cried sharply. I hate death. You should not. Hori's tone was quiet. Death is the chief source of wealth here in Egypt. Death bought the jewels you wear, Nofrit. Death feeds you and clothes you. She stared at him. What do you mean? I mean that Imhotep is a ka-priest, a mortuary priest all his lands, all his cattle, his timber, his flax, his barley, are the endowment of a tomb. He paused and then went on reflectively. We are a strange people, we Egyptians. We love life and so we start very early to plan for death. That is where the wealth of Egypt goes, into pyramids, into tombs, into tomb endowment. Nofrit said violently. Will you stop talking about death, Hori? I do not like it. Because you are truly Egyptian, because you love life, because, sometimes, you feel the shadow of death very near. Stop! She turned on him violently. Then, shrugging her shoulders, she turned away and began to descend the path. Renazen breathed a sigh of satisfaction. I am glad she has gone, she said childishly. You frightened her, Hori. Yes, did I frighten you, Renazend? And no. Renazend sounded a little unsure. It is true what you said, only I had never thought of it that way before. My father is a mortuary priest. Hori said with sudden bitterness. All Egypt is obsessed by death. And do you know why, Renazend? Because we have eyes in our bodies, but none in our minds. 
We cannot conceive of a life other than this one of a life after death. We can visualize only a continuation of what we know. We have no real belief in a god. Renazend stared at him in amazement. How can you say that, Hori? Why, we have many, many gods so many that I could not name them all. Only last night we were saying, all of us, which gods we preferred. Sobek was all for Sokmet and Kate prays always to Meskant. Kamini swears by Thoth as is natural, being a scribe. Satipi is for the falcon-headed Horus and also for our own mere seer. Yamos says that Ta is to be worshipped because he made all things. I myself love Isis. And Henet is all for our local god Ammonius. She says that there are prophecies amongst the priests that one day Ammonius will be the greatest god in all Egypt so she takes him offerings now while he is still a small god. And there is Are, the sun god, and Osiris before whom the hearts of the dead are weighed. Renazen paused, out of breath. Hori was smiling at her. And what is the difference, Renazen, between a god and a man? She stared at him. The gods are, they are magic. That is all. I don't know what you mean, Hori. I meant that to you a god is only a man or a woman who can do certain things that men and women cannot do. You say such odd things. I cannot understand you. She looked at him with a puzzled face then glancing down over the valley, her attention was caught by something else. Look, she exclaimed. Nofrit is talking to Sobek. She is laughing. Oh, she gave a sudden gasp, no, it is nothing. I thought he was going to strike her. She is going back to the house and he is coming up here. Sobek arrived looking like a thundercloud. May a crocodile devour that woman, he cried. My father was more of a fool than usual when he took her for a concubine. What did she say to you? asked Hori curiously. She insulted me as usual. Asked if my father had entrusted me with the sale of any more timber. Her tongue stings like a serpent. I would like to kill her. He moved along the platform and, picking up a piece of rock, threw it down to the valley below. The sound of it bouncing off the cliff seemed to please him. He levered up a larger piece, then sprang back as a snake that had been coiled up beneath it raised its head. It reared up, hissing, and Renazend saw that it was a cobra. Catching up a heavy staff Sobek attacked it furiously. A well-directed blow broke its back, but Sobek continued to slash at it, his head thrown back, his eyes sparkling, and below his breath he muttered some word which Renazend only half heard and did not recognize. She cried out, Stop, Sobek, stop, it's dead. Sobek paused, then he threw the staff away and laughed. One poisonous snake the less in the world. He laughed again, his good humor restored, and clattered off down the path again. Renazend said in a low voice, I believe Sobek likes killing things. Yes. There was no surprise in the word. Hori was merely acknowledging a fact which he evidently already knew well. Renazen turned to stare at him. She said slowly. Snakes are dangerous, but how beautiful that cobra looked. She stared down at its broken, twisted body. For some unknown reason she felt a pang at her heart. Hori said dreamily. I remember when we were all small children, Sobek attacked Yamos. Yamos was a year older, but Sobek was the bigger and stronger. He had a stone and he was banging Yamos' head with it. Your mother came running and tore them apart. I remember how she stood looking down at Yamos and how she cried out, You must not do things like that, Sobek it is dangerous. I tell you, it is dangerous. He paused and went on, She was very beautiful, I thought so as a child. You are like her, Renazend. Am I? Renazend felt pleased, warmed. Then she asked. Was Yamos badly hurt? No, it was not as bad as it looked. Sobek was very ill the next day. It might have been something he ate, but your mother said it was his rage and the hot sun it was the middle of summer. Sobek has a terrible temper, said Renazend thoughtfully. She looked again at the dead snake and turned away with a shiver. 2. When Renazend got back to the house Kamini was sitting on the front porch with a roll of papyrus. 
He was singing and she paused a minute and listened to the words. I will go to Memphis, sang Kamini, I will go to Ta, Lord of Truth. I will say to Ta, give me my sister tonight. The stream is wine, Ta is its reeds, Sekhmet its lotus, Irid its bud, Nefertum its flower. I will say to Ta, give me my sister tonight. The dawn breaks through her beauty. Memphis is a dish of love apples set before the fair face. He looked up and smiled at Renazend. Do you like my song, Renazend? What is it? It is a love song from Memphis. He kept his eyes on her, singing softly. Her arms are full of branches of the Percy, her hair is weighed down with unguent. She is like a princess of the Lord of the Two Lands. The color came up in Renazem's face. She passed on quickly into the house and almost collided with Nofret. Why are you in such a hurry, Renazend? Nofret's voice had a sharp edge to it. Renazend looked at her in faint surprise. Nofret was not smiling. Her face looked grim and tense and Renazend noticed that her hands were clenched at her sides. I am sorry, Nofret, I did not see you. It is dark in here when you come from the light outside. Yes, it is dark here, Nofret paused a moment. It would be pleasanter outside on the porch with Kamini's singing to listen to. He sings well, does he not? Yes, yes, I am sure he does. Yet you did not stay to listen. Kamini will be disappointed. Renazem's cheeks felt hot again. Nofret's cold, sneering glance made her uncomfortable. Do you not like love songs, Renazend? Does it matter to you, Nofret, what I like and do not like? So little cats have claws. What do you mean? Nofret laughed. You are not such a fool as you look, Renazend. So you find Kamini handsome? Well, that will please him no doubt. I think you are quite odious, said Renazend passionately. She ran past Nofret towards the back of the house. She heard the girl's mocking laugh. But through that laugh, sounding clearly in her memory, was the echo of Kamini's voice and the song that he had sung with his eyes watching her face. 3. That night Renazend had a dream. She was with Kai, sailing with him in the bark of the dead in the underworld. Kai was standing in the bows of the boat she could only see the back of his head. Then, as they drew near to sunrise, Kai turned his head, and Renazend saw that it was not Kai but Kamini. And at the same time the prow of the bark, the serpent's head, began to writhe. It was a live serpent, a cobra, and Renazend thought, it is the serpent that comes out in the tombs to eat the souls of the dead. She was paralyzed with fear. And then she saw the serpent's face was the face of Nofret and she woke up screaming, Nofret, Nofret. She had not really screamed it was all in the dream. She lay still, her heart beating, telling herself that none of all this was real. And then she thought suddenly, that is what Sobek said when he was killing the snake yesterday. He said, Nofret. Chapter 7 First month of winter fifth day. Renazem's dream had left her wakeful. She slept after it only in snatches and towards morning she did not sleep at all. She was obsessed by an obscure feeling of impending evil. She rose early and went out of the house. Her steps led her, as they did so often, to the Nile. There were fishermen out already and a big barge rowing with powerful strokes towards Thebes. There were other boats with sails flapping in the faint puffs of wind. Something turned over in Renazem's heart, the stirring of a desire for something she could not name. She thought, I feel, I feel, but she did not know what it was that she felt. That is to say, she knew no words to fit the sensation. She thought, I want, but what do I want? Was it Kai she wanted? Kai was dead, he would not come back. She said to herself, I shall not think of Kai anymore. What is the use? It is over, all that. Then she noticed another figure standing looking after the barge that was making for Thebes, and something about that figure some emotion it expressed by its very motionlessness struck Renazend, even as she recognized Nofret. Nofret staring out at the Nile. Nofret alone. Nofret thinking of, what? With a little shock Renazend suddenly realized how little they all knew about Nofret. 
They had accepted her as an enemy a stranger without interest or curiosity in her life or the surroundings from which she had come. It must, Renazend thought suddenly, be sad for Nofred alone here, without friends, surrounded only by people who disliked her. Slowly Renazend went forward until she was standing by Nofred's side. Nofred turned her head for a moment then moved it back again and resumed her study of the Nile. Her face was expressionless. Renazend said timidly. There are a lot of boats on the river. Yes. Renazend went on, obeying some obscure impulse towards friendliness. Is it like this, at all, where you come from? Nofret laughed, a short, rather bitter laugh. No, indeed. My father is a merchant in Memphis. It is gay and amusing in Memphis. There is music and singing and dancing. Then my father travels a good deal. I have been with him to Syria to Byblos beyond the gazelle's nose. I have been with him in a big ship on the wide seas. She spoke with pride and animation. Renazend stood quite still, her mind working slowly, but with growing interest and understanding. It must be very dull for you here, she said slowly. Nofret laughed impatiently. It is dead here dead, nothing but plowing and sowing and reaping and grazing and talk of crops and wranglings about the price of flax. Renazend was still wrestling with unfamiliar thoughts as she watched Nofret sideways. And suddenly, as though it was something physical, a great wave of anger and misery and despair seemed to emanate from the girl at her side. Renazend thought, she is as young as I am younger. And she is the concubine of that old man, that fussy, kindly, but rather ridiculous old man, my father. What did she, Renazend, know about Nofret? Nothing at all. What was it Hori had said yesterday when she had cried out, she is beautiful and cruel and bad. You are a child, Renazend. That was what he had said. Renazend knew now what he meant. Those words of hers had meant nothing you could not dismiss a human being so easily. What sorrow, what bitterness, what despair lay behind Nofret's cruel smile? What had Renazend, what had any of them, done to make Nofret welcome? Renazend said stumblingly, childishly. You hate us all I see why we have not been kind but now it is not too late. Can we not, you and I, Nofret, can we not be sisters to each other? You are far away from all you know you are alone can I not help? Her words faltered into silence. Nofret turned slowly. For a minute or two her face was expressionless there was even, Renazend thought, a momentary softening in her eyes. In that early morning stillness, with its strange clarity and peace, it was as though Nofred hesitated as though Renazem's words had touched in her some last core of irresolution. It was a strange moment, a moment Renazem was to remember afterwards. Then, gradually, Nofred's expression changed. It became heavily malevolent, her eyes smoldered. Before the fury of hate and malice in her glance, Renazem recoiled a step. Nofred said in a low, fierce voice. Go! I want nothing from any of you. Stupid fools, that is what you all are, every one of you. She paused a moment, then wheeled round and retraced her steps towards the house, walking with energy. Renazend followed her slowly. Curiously enough, Nofret's words had not made her angry. They had opened before her eyes a black abyss of hate and misery something quite unknown as yet in her own experience, and in her mind was only a confused, groping thought of how dreadful it must be to feel like that. 2. As Nofred entered the gateway and crossed the courtyard, one of Kate's children came running across her path, chasing a ball. Nofred thrust the child out of her way with an angry thrust that sent the little girl sprawling on the ground. The child set up a wail and Renazend ran to her and picked her up, saying indignantly. You should not have done that, Nofred. You have hurt her, see? She has cut her chin. Nofret laughed stridently. So I should be careful not to hurt these spoiled brats? Why? Are their mothers so careful of my feelings? Kate had come running out of the house at the sound of her child's wails. She ran to it, examining the injured face. Then she turned on Nofret. Devil and serpent. Evil one. Wait and see what we will do to you. With all the force of her arm she struck Nofret in the face. 
Renazend gave a cry and caught her arm before she could repeat the blow. Kate, Kate, you must not do that. Who says so? Let Nofrit look to herself. She is only one here among many. Nofrit stood quite still. The print of Kate's hand showed clear and red on her cheek. By the corner of the eye, where a bangle Kate wore on her wrist had cut the skin, a small trickle of blood was running down her face. But it was Nofrit's expression that puzzled Renazend, yes, and frightened her. Nofrit showed no anger. Instead there was a queer, exultant look in her eyes, and once more her mouth was curving up in its cat-like, satisfied smile. Thank you, Kate, she said. Then she walked on into the house. 3. Humming softly under her breath, her eyelids lowered, Nofrit called Hennet. Hennet came running, stopped, exclaimed. Nofrit cut short her exclamations. Fetch me Kamini. Tell him to bring his pen case and ink and papyrus. There is a letter to be written to the master. Hennet's eyes were fixed on Nofrit's cheek. To the master, I see. Then she asked, who did that? Kate. Nofrit smiled quietly and reminiscently. Hennet shook her head and clicked her tongue. All this is very bad, very bad, certainly the master must know of it. She darted a quick, sideways look at Nofrit. Yes, certainly Imhotep must know. Nofrit said smoothly, you and I, Hennet, think alike, I thought that we should do so. From the corner of her linen robe she detached a jewel of amethyst set in gold and placed it in the woman's hand. You and I, Hennet, have Imhotep's true welfare at heart. This is too good for me, Nofrit, you are too generous, such a lovely bit of workmanship. Imhotep and I appreciate fidelity. Nofrit was still smiling, her eyes narrow and cat-like. Fetch Kamini, she said. And come with him. You and he together are witnesses of what has occurred. Kamini came a little unwillingly, his brow puckered. Nofrit spoke imperiously. You remember Imhotep's instructions before he left? Yes, said Kamini. The time has come, said Nofrit. Sit and take ink and write as I tell you. Then as Kamini still hesitated, she said impatiently, What you write shall be what you have seen with your own eyes and heard with your own ears, and hen it shall confirm all I say. The letter must be dispatched with all secrecy and speed. Kamini said slowly, I do not like. Nofrit flashed out at him, I have no complaint against Renazend. Renazend is soft, weak and a fool, but she has not tried to harm me. Does that content you? The color of Kamini's bronze face deepened. I was not thinking of that. Nofrit said smoothly. I think you were, come now, fulfill your instructions, right? Yes, right, said Hennet. I'm so distressed by all this, so terribly distressed. Certainly Imhotep must know about it. It's only right that he should. However unpleasant a thing is, one has to do one's duty. I've always felt that. Nofrit laughed softly. I'm sure you have, Hennet. You shall do your duty. And Kamini shall do his office. And I, I shall do what it is my pleasure to do. But still Kamini hesitated. His face was sullen, almost angry. I do not like this, he said. Nofrit, you had better take a little time to think. You say that to me. Kamini flushed at her tone. His eyes avoided hers, but his sullen expression remained. Be careful, Kamini, said Nofrit smoothly. I have great influence with Imhotep. He listens to what I say, so far he has been pleased with you, she paused significantly. Are you threatening me, Nofrit? asked Kamini, angrily. Perhaps. He looked angrily at her for a moment or two then he bent his head. I will do as you say, Nofrit, but I think, yes, I think that you will be sorry. Are you threatening me, Kamini? I am warning you. Chapter 8 Second month of winter tenth day. Day followed day, and Renazend sometimes felt that she was living in a dream. She had made no more timid overtures to Nofrit. She was, now, afraid of Nofrit. There was something about Nofrit she did not understand. After the scene in the courtyard that day, Nofrit had changed. 
There was a complacency about her, an exultation, that Renazend could not fathom. Sometimes she thought that her own vision of Nofrit as profoundly unhappy must have been ridiculously wrong. Nofrit seemed pleased with life and herself and her surroundings. And yet, actually, her surroundings had very definitely changed for the worse. In the days following Imhotep's departure, Nofrit had quite deliberately, Renazend thought, set out to sow dissension between the various members of Imhotep's family. Now that family had closed its ranks solidly against the invader. There were no more dissensions between Satipi and Kate no railing of Satipi against the unfortunate Yamos. Sobek seemed quieter and boasted less. Ip was less impudent and offhand with his elder brothers. There seemed a new harmony between the family yet this harmony did not bring peace of mind to Renazend for with it went a curious, persistent undercurrent of ill will to Nofrit. The two women, Satipi and Kate, no longer quarreled with her they avoided her. They never spoke to her, and wherever she came they immediately gathered the children together and went elsewhere. At the same time, queer, annoying little accidents began to happen. A linen dress of Nofrit's was spoilt with an overhot iron, some dye stuff was spilt over another. Sometimes sharp thorns found their way into her clothing, a scorpion was discovered by her bed. The food that was served to her was over-seasoned or lacking in any seasoning. There was a dead mouse one day in her portion of bread. It was a quiet, relentless, petty persecution, nothing overt, nothing to lay hold of, it was essentially a woman's campaign. Then, one day, old ESA sent for Satipi, Kate and Renazend. Hennet was already there, shaking her head and rubbing her hands in the background. Huh, said ESA, peering at them with her usual ironical expression. So here are my clever granddaughters. What do you think you are doing, all of you? What is this I hear about Nofrit's dress being ruined and her food uneatable? Satipi and Kate both smiled. They were not nice smiles. Satipi said, has Nofrit complained? No, said ESA. She pushed the wig she always wore even in the house a little awry with one hand. No, Nofrit has not complained. That is what worries me. It does not worry me, said Satipi, tossing her handsome head. Because you are a fool, snapped ESA. Nofrit has twice the brains of any of you three. That remains to be seen, said Satipi. She looked good-humored and pleased with herself. What do you think you are all doing, inquired ESA. Satipi's face hardened. You are an old woman, ESA. I do not speak with any lack of respect but things no longer matter to you in the way they matter to us who have husbands and young children. We have decided to take the matter into our own hands, we have ways of dealing with a woman whom we do not like and will not accept. Fine words, said ESA. Fine words. She cackled. But a good discourse can be found with slave girls over the millstone. A true and wise saying, sighed Hennet from the background. ESA turned on her. Come, Hennet, what does Nofrit say to all this that is going on? You should know you are always waiting on her. As Imhotep told me to do. It is repugnant to me, of course, but I must do what the master ordered. You do not think I hope. ESA cut into the whining voice. We know all about you, Hennet. Always devoted and seldom thanked as you should be. What does Nofrit say to all this? That is what I asked you. Hennet shook her head. She says nothing. She just smiles. Exactly, ESA picked up a jujube from a dish at her elbow, examined it and put it in her mouth. Then she said with sudden, malevolent acerbity. You are fools, all of you. The power is with Nofrit, not with you. All you are doing is to play into her hands. I dare swear it even pleases her what you are doing. Satipi said sharply, nonsense. Nofrit is alone amongst many. What power has she? ESA said grimly. The power of a young, beautiful woman married to an aging man. I know what I am talking about. With a quick turn of her head she said, Hennet knows what I am talking about. Hennet started. She sighed and began to twist her hands. The master thinks a great deal of her, naturally, yes, quite naturally. Go to the kitchen, said ESA. 
Bring me some dates and some Syrian wine, yes, and honey too. When Hennet had gone, the old woman said. There is mischief brewing, I can smell it. Satipi, you are the leader in all this. Be careful that while you are thinking yourself clever, you do not play into Nofrit's hands. She leaned back and closed her eyes. I have warned you, now go. We in Nofrit's power, indeed, said Satipi with a toss of her head as they went out to the lake. ESA is so old she gets the most extraordinary ideas into her head. It is we who have got Nofrit in our power. We will do nothing against her that can be reported but I think, yes, I think, that she will soon be sorry she ever came here. You are cruel. Elf cruel, cried Renazend. Satipi looked amused. Do not pretend you love Nofrit, Renazend. I do not. But you sound so, so vindictive. I think of my children and Yamos. I am not a meek woman or one who brooks insult and I have ambition. I would wring that woman's neck with the greatest of pleasure. Unfortunately it is not so simple as that. Imhotep's anger must not be roused. But I think, in the end, something may be managed. 2. The letter came like a spear thrust to a fish. Dumbfounded, silent, Yamos, Sobek and Ip stared at Hori as he read out the words from the papyrus scroll. Did I not tell Yamos that I would hold him to blame if any harm came to my concubine? As you all live, I am against you and you are against me. I will no longer live with you in one house since you have not respected my concubine Nofret. You are no longer my son of my flesh. Neither are Sobek and I be my sons of my flesh. Each one of you has done harm to my concubine. That is attested by Kamini and Hennet. I will turn you out of my house, each of you. I have supported you now I will no longer support you. Hori paused and went on. The Ka servant Imhotep addresses Hori. To you who have been faithful, how are you in your life, safety and health? Salute my mother ESA for me and my daughter Renazend and greet Hennet. Look after my affairs carefully until I reach you and see that there be prepared for me a deed whereby my concubine Nofrit shall share with me in all my property as my wife. Neither Yamos, nor Sobek shall be associated with me, nor will I support them, and hereby I denounce them that they have done harm to my concubine. Keep all safe till I come. How evil is it when a man's household do evil deeds to his concubine? As for Ip, let him take warning, and if he does a single hurt to my concubine, he too shall depart from my house. There was a paralyzed silence, then Sobek rose up in a violent rage. How has this come about? What has my father heard? Who has been bearing false tales to him? Shall we endure this? My father cannot disinherit us so and give all his goods to his concubine. Hori said mildly. It will cause unfavorable comment and it will not be accepted as a right action but legally it is in his power. He can make a deed of settlement in any way he wishes. She has bewitched him that black, jeering serpent has put a spell upon him. Yamos murmured as though dumbfounded. It is unbelievable it cannot be true. My father is mad, mad, cried Ip. He turns even against me at this woman's bidding. Hori said gravely. Imhotep will return shortly that he says. By then his anger may have abetted, he may not really mean to do as he says. There was a short, unpleasant laugh. It was Satipi who had laughed. She stood looking at them from the doorway into the women's quarters. So that is what we are to do, is it, most excellent Hori? Wait and see. Yamo said slowly. What else can we do? What else? Satipi's voice rose. She screamed out. What have you got in your veins, all of you? Milk? Yamos, I know, is not a man. But you, Sobek, have you no remedy for these ills? A knife in the heart and the girl could do us no more harm. Satipi, cried Yamos. My father would never forgive us. So you say. But I tell you a dead concubine is not the same as a live concubine. Once she was dead, his heart would return to his sons and their children. And besides, how should he know how she died? We could say a scorpion stung her. 
We are together in this, are we not? Yamo said slowly. My father would know. Hennet would tell him. Satipi gave a hysterical laugh. Most prudent Yamos. Most gentle, cautious Yamos. It is you who should look after the children and do woman's work in the back of the house. Sokmet help me. Married to a man who is not a man. And you, Sobek, for all your bluster, what courage have you, what determination? I swear by R.A., I am a better man than either of you. She swung round and went out. Kate, who had been standing behind her, came a step forward. She said, her voice deep and shaken. It is true what Satipi says. She is a better man than any of you. Yamos, Sobek, I.P., will you all sit here doing nothing? What of our children, Sobek? Cast out to starve. Very well, if you will do nothing, I will. You are none of you men. As she in turn went out, Sobek sprang to his feet. By the nine gods of the Ennead, Kate is right. There is a man's work to be done and we sit here talking and shaking our heads. He strode towards the door. Hori called after him. Sobek, Sobek, where are you going? What are you going to do? Sobek, handsome and fierce, shouted from the doorway. I shall do something that is clear. And what I do I shall enjoy doing. 3. Renazend came out onto the porch and stood there for a moment, shielding her eyes against the sudden glare. She felt sick and shaken and full of a nameless fear. She said to herself, repeating the words over and over again mechanically. I must warn Nofrit, I must warn her. Behind her, in the house, she could hear men's voices, those of Hori and Yamos blending into each other, and above them, shrill and clear, the boyish tones of Ip. Satipi and Kate are right. There are no men in this family. But I am a man. Yes, I am a man in heart if not in years. Nofrit has jeered at me, laughed at me, treated me as a child. I will show her that I am not a child. I am not afraid of my father's anger. I know my father. He is bewitched the woman has put a spell on him. If she were destroyed his heart would come back to me to me. I am the son he loves best. You all treat me as a child but you shall see. Yes, you shall see. Rushing out of the house he collided with Renazend and almost knocked her down. She clutched at his sleeve. Ip, Ip, where are you going? To find Nofrit. She shall see whether she can laugh at me. Wait a little. You must calm down. We must none of us do anything rash. Rash? The boy laughed scornfully. You are like Yamos. Prudence. Caution. Nothing must be done in a hurry. Yamos is an old woman. And Sobek is all words and boasting. Let go of me, Renazend. He twitched the linen of his sleeve from her grasp. Nofrit, where is Nofrit? Hennet, who had just come bustling out from the house, murmured. Oh dear, this is a bad business, a very bad business. What will become of us all? What would my dear mistress say? Where is Nofrit, Hennet? Renazem cried, don't tell him, but Hennet was already answering. She went out the back way. Down towards the flax fields. Ip rushed back through the house and Renazend said reproachfully, You should not have told him, Hennet. You don't trust old Hennet. You never have confidence in me. The whine in her voice became more pronounced. But poor old Hennet knows what she is doing. The boy needs time to cool off. He won't find Nofrit by the flax fields. She grinned. Nofrit is here in the pavilion with Kamini. She nodded her head across the courtyard. And she added with what seemed rather disproportionate stress. With Kamini. But Renazend had already started to cross the courtyard. Teddy, dragging her wooden lion, came running from the lake to her mother and Renazend caught her up in her arms. She knew, as she held the child to her, the force that was driving Satipi and Kate. These women were fighting for their children. Teddy gave a little fretful cry. Not so tight, mother, not so tight. You are hurting me. Renazend put the child down. 
She went slowly across the courtyard. On the far side of the pavilion Nofrit and Kamini were standing together. They turned as Renazend approached. Renazend spoke quickly and breathlessly. Nofrit, I have come to warn you. You must be careful. You must guard yourself. A look of contemptuous amusement passed over Nofrit's face. So the dogs are howling. They are very angry, they will do some harm to you. Nofrit shook her head. No one can harm me, she said, with a superb confidence. If they did, it would be reported to your father and he would exact vengeance. They will know that when they pause to think. She laughed. What fools they have been with their petty insults and persecutions. It was my game they played all the time. Renazend said slowly. So you have planned for this all along? And I was sorry for you, I thought we were unkind. I am not sorry any longer, I think, Nofrit, that you are wicked. When you come to deny the forty-two sins at the hour of judgment you will not be able to say, I have done no evil. Nor will you be able to say, I have not been covetous. And your heart that is being weighed in the scales against the feather of truth will sink in the balance. Nofrit said sullenly. You are very pious all of a sudden. But I have not harmed you, Renazend. I said nothing against you. Ask Kamini if that is not so. Then she walked across the courtyard and up the steps to the porch. Hennet came out to meet her and the two women went into the house. Renazen turned slowly to Kamini. So it was you, Kamini, who helped her to do this to us. Kamini said eagerly. Are you angry with me, Renazen? But what could I do? Before Imhotep left he charged me solemnly that I was to write at Nofrit's bidding at any time she might ask me to do so. Say you do not blame me, Renazend. What else could I do? I cannot blame you, said Renazend slowly. You had, I suppose, to carry out my fat. Hers orders. I did not like doing it and it is true, Renazend, there was not one word said against you. As if I cared about that. But I do. Whatever Nofrit had told me, I would not have written one word that might harm you, Renazend, please believe me. Renazend shook her head perplexedly. The point Kamini was laboring to make seemed of little importance to her. She felt hurt and angry as though Kamini, in some way, had failed her. Yet he was, after all, a stranger. Though allied by blood, he was nevertheless a stranger whom her father had brought from a distant part of the country. He was a junior scribe who had been given a task by his employer, and who had obediently carried it out. I wrote no more than truth, Kamini persisted. There were no lies set down, that I swear to you. No, said Renazend. There would be no lies. Nofred is too clever for that. Old ESA had, after all, been right. That persecution over which Satipi and Kate had gloated had been just exactly what Nofred had wanted. No wonder that she had gone about smiling her cat-like smile. She is bad, said Renazend, following her thoughts. Yes. Kamini assented. Yes, he said. She is an evil creature. Renazend turned and looked at him curiously. You knew her before she came here, did you not? You knew her in Memphis? Kamini flushed and looked uncomfortable. I did not know her well, I had heard of her. A proud girl, they said, ambitious and hard and one who did not forgive. Renazen flung back her head in sudden impatience. I do not believe it, she said. My father will not do what he threatens. He is angry at present but he could not be so unjust. When he comes he will forgive. When he comes, said Kamini, Nofrit will see to it that he does not change his mind. You do not know Nofrit, Renazen. She is very clever and determined and she is, remember, very beautiful. Yes, admitted Renazend. She is beautiful. She got up. For some reason the thought of Nofrit's beauty hurt her. 4. Renazend spent the afternoon playing with the children. As she took part in their game, the vague ache in her heart lessened. It was not until just before sunset that she stood upright, smoothing back her hair and the pleats of her dress which had got crumpled and disarranged, and wondered vaguely why neither Satipi nor Kate had been out as usual. 
Kamini had long gone from the courtyard. Renazend went slowly across into the house. There was no one in the living room and she passed through to the back of the house and the women's quarters. ESA was nodding in the corner of her room and her little slave girl was marking piles of linen sheets. They were baking batches of triangular loaves in the kitchen. There was no one else about. A curious emptiness pressed on Renazend's spirits. Where was everyone? Hori had probably gone up to the tomb. Yamos might be with him or out on the fields. Sobek and Ipi would be with the cattle or possibly seeing to the corn bins. But where were Satipi and Kate, and where, yes, where was Nofret? The strong perfume of Nofret's unguent filled her empty room. Renazend stood in the doorway staring at the little wood pillow, at a jewel box, at a heap of bead bracelets and a ring set with a blue glazed scarab. Perfumes, unguents, clothes, linens, sandals all speaking of their owner, of Nofret who lived in their midst and who was a stranger and an enemy. Where, Renazend wondered, could Nofret herself be? She went slowly towards the back entrance of the house and met Hennet coming in. Where is everybody, Hennet? The house is empty except for my grandmother. How should I know, Renazend? I have been working, helping with the weaving, seeing to a thousand and one things. I have not time for going for walks. That meant, thought Renazend, that somebody had gone for a walk. Perhaps Satipi had followed Yamos up to the tomb to harangue further. But where was Kate? Unlike Kate to be away from her children for so long. And again, a strange disturbing undercurrent, there ran the thought. Where is Nofret? As though Hennet had read the thought in her mind, she supplied the answer. As for Nofret, she went off a long time ago up to the tomb. Oh well, Hori is a match for her. Hennet laughed spitefully. Hori has brains too. She sidled a little closer to Renazend. I wish you knew, Renazend, how unhappy I've been over all this. She came to me, you know, that day with the mark of Kate's fingers on her cheek and the blood streaming down. And she got Kamini to write and me to say what I'd seen and of course I couldn't say I hadn't seen it. Oh, she's a clever one. And I, thinking all the time of your dear mother. Renazen pushed past her and went out into the golden glow of the evening sun. Deep shadows were on the cliffs, the whole world looked fantastic at this hour of sunset. Renazen's steps quickened as she took the way to the cliff path. She would go up to the tomb, find Hori. Yes, find Hori. It was what she had done as a child when her toys had been broken when she had been uncertain or afraid. Hori was like the cliffs themselves, steadfast, immovable, unchanging. Renazen thought confusedly, everything will be alright when I get to Hori. Her steps quickened, she was almost running. Then suddenly she saw Satipi coming towards her. Satipi, too, must have been up to the tomb. What a very odd way Satipi was walking, swaying from side to side, stumbling as though she could not see. When Satipi saw Renazend she stopped short, her hand went to her breast. Renazend, drawing close, was startled at the sight of Satipi's face. What's the matter, Satipi, are you ill? Satipi's voice in answer was a croak, her eyes were shifting from side to side. No, no, of course not. You look ill. You look frightened. What has happened? What should have happened? Nothing, of course. Where have you been? I went up to the tomb to find Yamos. He was not there. No one was there. Renazen still stared. This was a new Satipi, a Satipi with all the spirit and resolution drained out of her. Come, Renazend, come back to the house. Satipi put a slightly shaking hand on Renazend's arm, urging her back the way she had come and at the touch Renazend felt a sudden revolt. No, I am going up to the tomb. There is no one there, I tell you. I like to look over the river. To sit there. But the sun is setting, it is too late. Satipi's fingers closed vice-like over Renazend's arm. Renazend wrenched herself loose. Let me go, Satipi. No. Come back. Come back with me. But Renazend had already broken loose, pushed past her, and was on her way to the cliff. There was something, instinct told her there was something, her steps quickened to a run. 
Then she saw it, the dark bundle lying under the shadow of the cliff, she hurried along until she stood close beside it. There was no surprise in her at what she saw. It was as though already she had expected it. Nofrit lay with her face upturned, her body broken and twisted. Her eyes were open and sightless. Renazen bent and touched the cold stiff cheek then stood up again looking down at her. She hardly heard Satipi come up behind her. She must have fallen, Satipi was saying. She has fallen. She was walking along the cliff path and she fell. Yes, Renazen thought, that was what had happened. Nofrit had fallen from the path above, her body bouncing off the limestone rocks. She may have seen a snake, said Satipi, and been startled. There are snake. S asleep in the sun on that path sometimes. Snakes. Yes, snakes. Sobek and the snake. A snake, its back broken, lying dead in the sun. Sobek, his eyes gleaming. She thought, Sobek, no frit. Then sudden relief came to her as she heard Hori's voice. What has happened? She turned with relief. Hori and Yamos had come up together. Satipi was explaining eagerly that Nofrit must have fallen from the path above. Yamos said, she must have come up to find us, but Hori and I have been out to look at the irrigation canals. We have been away at least an hour. As we came back we saw you standing here. Renazem said, and her voice surprised her, it sounded so different, where is Sobek? She felt rather than saw Hori's immediate sharp turn of the head at the question. Yamos sounded merely puzzled as he said. Sobek? I have not seen him all the afternoon. Not since he left us so angrily in the house. But Hori was looking at Renazemp. She raised her eyes and met his. She saw him turn from their gaze and look down thoughtfully at Nofrit's body and she knew with absolute certainty exactly what he was thinking. He murmured questioningly. Sobek? Oh no, Renazen heard herself saying. Oh no, oh no. Satipi said again urgently, she fell from the path. It is narrow just above here and dangerous. Sobek liked killing. What I do, I shall enjoy doing. Sobek killing a snake. Sobek meeting Nofrit on that narrow path. She heard herself murmuring brokenly. We don't know, we don't know. And then, with intimate relief, with the sense of a burden taken away, she heard Hori's grave voice giving weight and value to Satipi's asseveration. She must have fallen from the path. His eyes met Renazem's. She thought, he and I know, we shall always know. Aloud she heard her voice saying shakily. She fell from the path. And like a final echo, Yamos' gentle voice chimed in. She must have fallen from the path.